Yeah, thanks for having me, I'm Philip. Uh, I'm a compiler engineer at Grok. Um, I will uh, be going over um, the Grok compiler. And uh, so I will start by, um, sorry, one second. Yeah, so uh, yeah, let's just go from here. Um, so yeah, we'll be talking about uh, the Grok compiler, where it fits into uh, Grok flow. Then we will be uh, talking about the various phases of the compiler. We will talk about the front end, the middle end, the back end, and uh, the assembler. Um, from there, we'll talk about how uh, the Grok compiler handles big models and uh, how we use multi-chip partitioning for that. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, the future uh, improvements that you can expect to see from Grok in upcoming releases. Um, so for those of you that attended the session yesterday, you were introduced to Grokflow, which is our recommended way of working with the Grok software stack. Um, the Grok compiler is the real engine uh, powering Grokflow. So after Grokflow has done its input model pre-processing, it calls into the Grok compiler. Um, so what is a compiler? A compiler's job is to take some input program and translate that into instructions that can run on the target machine. In Grok's case, this input program is an Onyx model, and the output is Allen assembly, a textual representation of the instructions for controlling different uh, functional units. On the left here, we have uh, some contrived model written in PyTorch. It's being exported to the Onyx format, and we want to compile that down to instructions that run on the Grok chip. Um, so let's take a deeper look at the front end. Um, most commonly, an ML program will be written in uh, PyTorch. You express some linear algebra operations you want to execute to do some ML task. PyTorch's internal representation of this program is a compute graph. Tensors are edges, and nodes are the operations. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so most commonly, an ML program will be written in PyTorch. You express some linear algebra operations you want to execute to do some ML task. PyTorch's internal representation of this program is a compute graph. Tensors are edges, and the nodes are the operations. The front end's job is to take these frameworks and really their graph representations and translate that into our own high-level intermediate graph representation called G10. G10 is a canonical subset of operators. And it allows us to represent practically all real world ML programs. Where PyTorch has thousands of operations, G10 has tens of operations. Right now, our front end relies on Onyx to trim down the op space from thousands to hundreds. And then the front end team translates these hundreds of Onyx ops into tens of G10 operations. We're able to use uh, tens of operations because we're a kernelist compiler. Many other hardware platforms need hundreds of operations for them to be performant, as it allows them to specialize for each of these ops. Because of our data flow architecture, we don't have to. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Um, so let's uh, talk about the middle end. The middle end is what looks most like a conventional compiler, more specifically a SimDizing compiler. It takes these G10 operations and tiles them into 320 element vectors, and we call this layout marking. We tr then translate these tiled operations into a lower representation that resembles the instructions available on uh, different functional units. Um, next. Um, so um, uh, in this example, uh, we're multiplying uh, an n by m with an m by l. Um, each of these uh, tiles is uh, 320 by 320. And a layout marking will look at the tensor input and output and choose how to tile them. The choice depends on how they're used. In this case, the orange and yellow tensors participate in matrix multiplication. And as a result, the left tensor is tiled into 320 element vectors on the row axes. And the right hand side is tiled uh, on the column axes. Um, if you remember Andrew's uh, Grok architecture slides from yesterday, uh, the 320 number comes from the fact that the SIMD units are of length 320, and those are the foundational building blocks of the Grok chip. Next. The next job of the middle end is to translate these graph operations into instructions that explicitly control the functional units. So continuing on with uh, matrix multiplication as a guiding example, we would rewrite it into a series of instructions for controlling uh, the MXM, namely install weights, load weight buffer, 
activation buffer control. Uh, those are the instructions, as well as some memory reads and writes uh, to store temporary data. Uh, and um, if we were to do uh, something similar with data movement operations, such as transpose, uh, we would use uh, the, op the instructions on the S SXM. And for more interesting G10 operations like convolution, we might need uh, instructions that span many different uh, functional units. So we might be using MEM, VXM, MXM, and SXM all in conjunction. Um, on a traditional architecture, the compiler's work would be done. The target hardware would be able to take the compute instructions and run them on hardware. However, this isn't the case for the Grok chip. At this stage, we have the what. We know what we want to do. We know what type of functional units we need and what instructions they will call. And we also know the data dependence between our different instructions. However, we are still missing the when and where. And uh, this is where the back end comes in. Okay, so I have a terrible analogy here and I'm wondering if I should use it. I think I'm gonna go for it. So I, I would uh, say uh, the scheduler, it's, it's almost like uh, we're planning a road trip and we wanna visit Barcelona, Rome and Copenhagen. And we have a rough order of which cities we wanna see first, but we haven't booked our Airbnbs or our flights or our buses. So we still need to figure out if it's feasible and the best way to get between these places. Um, so yeah, the backend is really just a scheduling problem. We have to consider which compute cycle we want to schedule an instruction, which functional unit we want to use. So if we're still thinking about uh, matrix multiplication, we have an MXM on the Eastern hemisphere and the Western hemisphere. So are we gonna schedule on the, on the Eastern hemisphere or the Western hemisphere? What streams are we gonna use? Um, and then we also have to think about things like slice conflicts. We must avoid them if we wanna have a feasible schedule. We also have space and time limits that we must respect. And all these constraints and all the connectivity and the layout of the functional units are all based on the Grok chip model, which is a full look into what the hardware is actually doing. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, uh, we have uh, two different uh, scheduling approaches. We uh, have uh, vector scheduling, which uh, schedules a single vector operation at a time. And then we have uh, tensor scheduling and or bulk scheduling. And uh, we bulk schedule multiple vector operations of the same type so that they can occupy a functional unit in consecutive cycles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we have a Grok view snapshot. And so just a reminder, uh, this is a snapshot in time. Um, the colors here indicate where on the chip uh, the constants currently are and where the data in transit currently is. So on the left, we have vector scheduling. It looks a lot like abstract art. That is because uh, we're scheduling thing vectors individually. And we also use uh, random addressing to, minis to minimize the chance of uh, stream conflicts. Uh, on the right, we can see uh, we have tensor scheduling and it retains a lot more uh, regularity. And, it, um, and as a result, um, we uh, can do things like uh, instruction compression better because uh, it's a lot more regular. Um, at the bottom, you can see that uh, we have we have the Grok flow. Um, we, we, we can add an argument to the Grok flow Grokit call uh, to choose between vector and tensor scheduling. So uh, we can uh, use the effort high flag uh, to uh, do vector scheduling, and we can do the F use the effort standard flag to do tensor scheduling. Uh, next, please. Um, so once we're done with the scheduler, we can split out. Um, we can spit out Allen assembly. Uh, next, um, one more. Uh, yeah, and so uh, the assembler is still under uh, the uh, Grokflow suite of tools, so you likely won't have to use it manually, uh, but it is uh, still something that we do in its own process. So the assembler takes the .aa file, which is a textual representation of the instructions, and it will output a .iop, which is a binary format. Um, next. The assembler is mainly concerned uh, with the ICU. And uh, one more. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the assembler is also uh, concerned with uh, memory. Uh, the compiler makes sure to reserve some memory for the instructions on the chip. 
and the, uh, the assembler uh, compresses and packs these instructions into memory. And it adds uh, instruction fetches to uh, stream the instructions uh, to the ICUs. Um, next. So now let's talk about uh, multi-chip. Uh, next. On a single chip, you have uh, two forms of parallelism. You have uh, SIMD, as the functional units operate on 320 uh, byte vectors at a time. And then secondly, we have uh, multiple functional units uh, we can perform, we can, we can use to perform operations on uh, concurrently. Uh, so you can uh, do a MXM uh, operation in the left hemisphere and an MXM operation uh, in the, the right hemisphere uh, because uh, we, we have these different functional units. Um, however, we can also get uh, parallelism uh, by using uh, multiple chips. So we can just throw multiple chips at the problem. Next. Next. Um, so a, a useful uh, compiler abstraction is that, uh, a, a use, yeah, a useful compiler abstraction uh, for C to C is that uh, when we send uh, from the source TSP at cycle n to the destination TSP, we will receive that vector at cycle n plus l. At, yeah, at n plus l, where l is a known uh, transmission latency. The uh, compiler also knows uh, the channel throughput and how to pace the transmission of consecutive vectors. Next. So there's uh, two forms of partitioning. Uh, the first is uh, interop partitioning. We split the original compute graph into subgraphs, and then we run these different subgraphs on different chips, making sure to pass the data dependent tensors over C to C. This helps with fitability as we're spreading the constants across the chips. And uh, this will improve throughput as we can use the approach to pipeline compute of uh, consecutive inferences. Device zero can start working on the next inference as soon as it is handed uh, C to C uh, communication to device one. And so device zero, one, and two will work in parallel uh, on consecutive inferences. Next. And then we can also split one op across multiple chips. This is called uh, intra-op partitioning. Uh, this accomplishes two things. First, first, it spreads a large op across multiple chips, which is particularly useful for mat moles of a tensor with an extremely large constant. And secondly, it improves latency because the work to execute the op is parallelized across multiple chips. And to bring this full circle, uh, G10, our high-level graph representation, only had tens of operations. So we only have to model how these operations would be partitioned uh, across multiple chips. So if, we're per so if we have a partitioning scheme for uh, convolutions, matrix multiplications, binary and unary ops, some data movement operations, and a few others, then we can inter-op split basically any graph we uh, capture in G10. Um, could uh, you go to the next slide, please? So uh, let's uh, make this a little bit more concrete uh, by looking at a transformer. I won't go into too much detail because uh, Peter will be presenting on LLMs uh, in far more detail uh, shortly. So a transformer it first embeds and encodes inputs, and then it decodes outputs one token at a, at a time in a chain of decoders. Uh, next. Um, so here we just have a simplified view of a bunch of decoders and uh next and so we can interop uh, partition the decoder layers uh in this visualization i'm grouping uh 2d coder layers per device um however in practice these decoder blocks are often too big to fit on a single chip so we further partition each block uh, with interop partitioning um, so let's look at how uh, one feed forward network in a decoder block could be intra-op partitioned. So the algorithm could go something like this. Supposing we want to split across eight chips, uh, we could take the, uh, the FFN matmol zero and one, and uh, we decide that we will slice based on those operations. So the weights in the ops will be sliced eight times. Then we will uh, propagate the slice to the element-wise multiply. Um, and from there, we'll propagate the slice to the FFN mat mold two. And uh, from there, we can do a C to C reduce. And so uh, this is just the feed forward network uh, in one of the decoder layers. We'd also want to do something uh, like this for uh, 
the group detention uh, that that's uh, earlier. Um, but yeah, that, that's uh, it for intra-op partitioning. I just wanted to give you guys some more concrete examples of uh, how we actually use intra-op and inter-op on real models. So now I want to just uh, briefly touch on uh, what's coming up in uh, future releases. Um, so uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, so we're going to have uh, faster compiles. Um, this is something that we're actively working on, and we've gotten uh, more than 2x faster over the last six months. Um, and faster compiles is really important because not only does it mean you guys can iterate faster, but having faster compiles means that we have more opportunity to uh, explore the optimization space. And so you can imagine by just trying more uh, optimizations, uh, if we give ourselves the same amount of time, uh, we'll be able to uh, find better solutions. Um, then we are also uh, working on adding native front ends. So instead of going through Onyx as an intermediary, uh, we're looking at uh, ingesting PyTorch natively. And then um, we have some other really exciting features that we're working on, uh, such as PowerWare scheduling. So imagine you could compile and make sure you don't uh, go over a certain amount of power uh, per inference, and you could uh, enforce that at compile time. Yeah.